on this computer. Great. Hello, everybody. So my name is Tomasz Zajkowski, and today I will have a pleasure to share my astrobiological perspective on prions. I will start this presentation with a few words about NASA Ames Research Center, where I conduct my research for the last three years. Then I will make an introduction of prions and amyloids from a historical perspective. And then I will explain in details what amyloids and prions are, followed by the description of the results that I uh, recently made of my recent work. And at the end, I will briefly mention my future plans and other activities that we are developing together with Blue Marble. So let's start with NASA Ames. The Institute is located in the heart of Silicon Valley, south from San Francisco. And uh, there is a lot of basic research going on at Ames. And because of that, Ames is probably the closest to the idea of the university out of all NASA institutes. And Ames is uh, actually is where the astrobiology was born, where the first astrobiological science conference took place. That's where the instruments for Viking mission were developed. And that's where Sanjoy has his office. And of course, um, all NASA facilities are very oriented on technology and focus on technology, hence uh, the presence of uh, the world largest wind tunnels on the base. And in some of these uh, wind tunnels, the parts for space shuttles were tested. So a very exciting place to be. Working at Ames is a real pleasure. And while being here, I have a chance to witness, for example, preparation of samples that will later be launched to the orbit. And like this one on the left, uh, there is a photo of Ivan Paolo Lima, who is also Blue Marble Space Scientist, and he's preparing an experiment to investigate heterologous expression of proteins in microgravity. I even had a chance to watch the launch of the rocket SpaceX that sent the experiment to orbit. This is an amazing photo. Unfortunately, it's not mine, but it beautifully, beautifully captured the separation of Falcon 9 rocket. The blue nebula that you can see is made of gas released after separation of two parts. And these gases are illuminated by the sun, which is still operating at the altitude, while at the ground level, it's already getting dark. If you look closely, you can even see two parts of the rocket. Um, the one on the right is already on a way back, and the other one is still reaching the orbit. And this is the picture of the satellite to which the experiment designed by Ivan was attached. So impressive experiments like this one are the motivation for my research at NASA, although I personally haven't been able to reach the space yet. OK, let me tell you how I started my work at NASA and what it, what it does, what does it have to do with prions. So before coming to Ames, I specialized in neurobiology. And more precisely, I researched prions. And it was this, these remarkable particles that allowed me to jump from neurobiology to astrobiology. OK, so now I will explain how prions are discovered, how they were discovered, and what they are. Mm -hmm. So when talking about prions, it's probably best to start with mad cow disease because the term prion became recognizable by general public because of the disease. But during this talk, I'd like to show you that now we know that not all prions are bad and they are very common in nature. So prions attracted global attention at the end of the last century when epidemic of uh, prion disease broke out in Great Britain. This epidemic was very unusual because it could spread between species and precisely from cow to humans. Uh, it was enough to eat infected meat to develop disease and the first symptoms could appear even years after exposure. To prevent the spread of the epidemic, four million cows were killed and the epidemic was finally stopped, uh, but not before 200 people died. The pattern mechanism, as well as the mode of transmission of this protein, of this disease, the prion disease, 
is very unusual. And the history of the safe, deciphering of the Prian mystery goes back to Daniel Gaidusek that conducted his research on the cannibalistic tribes in Papua New Guinea. In the photo, you can see women and children infected with Prian disease called Kuru from the local word shake. And shaking was one of the symptoms of the disease and these people need a support to stand straight. This is why they hold sticks. There is also a reason why women and children were more infected, like more at risk of infection. And this is because they usually ate the brains of their relatives while the male warriors usually got muscles that are less infectious. So Daniel was rewarded Nobel Prize for the discovery of infectious neurodegenerative disorder in human. Uh, at this time, he thought that the, disease, that the disease is caused by slow viruses. And so far, two Nobel Prizes have been awarded for research on prions, one for Kuru and the second for identifying the actual infectious agent uh, as something that was even smaller than a virus, ultimately identified as a protein named PRP, so prion protein. Uh, and it also, then the word prion comes from proteinaceous infectious particles. Scientific community was very reluctant to accept the discovery of an infectious agent that was made only of protein. Prions still are uh, the only known infectious agents that has no nucleic acid. And this difference makes prion and especially prion spread, fundamentally different from all biological processes that we know. The fact that the prion can store biological information seems to be contradicting our understanding of the information transfer in biological systems, so-called central dogma of molecular biology. This uniqueness promises some amazing discoveries in the fundamentals of how the biology works, but only now we begin to understand how important this phenomenon is in normal biology. The most important discovery in, in the field of prions in the last 20 years is a realization that prions are common in nature. First, thanks to uh, introduction of the concept of prion in medicine, it became possible to explain very strange patterns of inheritance in yeast, followed by the discovery of many new prions in very different organisms. But please don't be afraid because it was also shown that prions can have beneficial functions. They're not all deadly. So far I told you how prions were discovered and where you can find them, but I haven't told you what the prion really is. Um, so of course, as our knowledge of, about prions is rapidly growing and with it, the definition is changing. But here I quote one of the definitions that is useful, but it's certainly not final. Uh, it says that prion is a protein that changes between different structural and functional states. And one of these states can stabilize itself, maintain this alternative form. This animation uh, shows formation of the original prion that causes, for example, Medco disease. So at the beginning, the protein changes its secondary structure it increases the content of beta sheet. And this misfolded protein is interacting with other copies of the same protein, changing it in the same way to the same configuration, and the process repeats indefinitely, building a higher order structure that grows in one dimension, forming fiber. And such fibers are shown on the right, and they're called amyloids. So most known prions acquire the form of amyloid. Thus, the prion may also be seen as a subtype of amyloid. And importantly, amyloids that are built out of the same protein can take slightly different shapes. The shape depends on the final conformation of the protein that builds it. And interestingly, the different shapes of the fiber have different impact on infectivity or the ability to cross a species barrier. 
the conclusion is that biological information is stored in the structure of the amyloid itself. So the preent terminology can be a little bit confusing. So allow me to add some, um, make some additional remarks. The proteins that build prions are referred to as prion proteins, no matter if they are in misfolded form or, or the normal form. The word prion refers to infectious particle and not to the protein that makes it. A little confusing can also be the fact that the original, originally discovered prion protein was simply called prion protein. So there are more different prion proteins than the prion protein if you know what I mean. I told you it's confusing. But let's leave the terminology and come back to molecular mechanisms beyond prions. So amyloids that build prion grow exponentially fast. Because of that, they're able to quickly use, they can quickly use up all copies of the protein that builds it, that builds it and that, are, that is available in the cell. Because of that, Phenotypically, it usually looks like gene deletion, like the protein was missing, although it's still there. And so I want to make an analogy to this process using one of the Kurt Vonnegut's novel. In his book titled Cat's Cradle, scientists created a highly stable form of crystalline ice, uh, crystalline water called ice nine. Uh, this fictional ice nine can, can stay frozen even in high temperatures, and it instantly freezes any liquid water it touches. And in the book, Ice Nine is accidentally released into nature and solidifies all the oceans, causing, of course, a global catastrophe. And same as Ice Nine, a growing amyloid fiber quickly depletes or native folds of the protein that builds it in a chain reaction of misfolding. It can be, you know, deleterious. It's kind of infectious. So it is possible that you already heard the name amyloid in the context of diseases in which amyloid accumulates in brains or other tissues, such as Alzheimer disease, Parkinson disease, Huntington disease, or even diabetes. But I'd like to stress that these disorders are not contagious. And as I mentioned, not all amyloids are bad. Uh, for example, protein called MAVs is a key to our ability to fight certain viral infections. Uh, in cells infected, mm, it aggregates, the MAVs aggregates, induces uh, product, and this aggregation helps uh, pro in production of interference mm, and recruit macrophages in, in consequence. And other amyloids are used, um, in, uh, for example, in, sorting, uh, in storing peptide hormones or building spider web. And on the image, you can see a matrix formed by amyloid protein produced by E. coli. Amyloids are very stable, what make them interesting from the perspective of nanomaterials or synthetic biology, and also explains why they're used in biofilms. And here I have drawn a diagram on which yellow flag designates any possible uh, synthetic modification of the protein, like addition of functional domain, or for example, a catalytical domain or, or the metal binding domain. And a growing fiber would concentrate the activity on, of the attached domain on the small, in the smaller volume and also add stability to the construct. In another example, amyloids can be, for example, decorated with gold and therefore forming conducting nanowires. Okay, but what is the difference between amyloid and prion? So as I mentioned, prion can be seen as a subtype of amyloid. Uh, the formation of a functional amyloid is often associated with uh, gaining function. And dysfunction usually directly radiates from the physical properties of the fibers, resistance, stability. And prion formation is often associated with loss of function. So another difference is that prion aggregation is reversible. So the prion protein 
can act as a bidirectional molecular switch, while amyloid cannot. So how do you turn off the prion? Let's start with the fact that prion can show up spontaneously. It's just a matter of statistics when a protein with an amino acid sequence that permits beta sheet formation will eventually acquire amyloid promoting fold. So prion can be also inherited cytoplasmically or picked up from environment. And when the aggregate is formed, it can be either dis uh, disassembled by prion remodeling factors like HSP14 in 104 in, in East, or can be locked in the mother cell during division. And in this case, the offspring will be free of prion, or you could call cured. And as I mentioned, prion can mimic gene deletion, but in some cases, the phenotypes are more complicated. And conveniently for research, some prion switching in East include things like change in color of the colony, that is very easy to observe. Uh, typical is also presence of uh, cytoplasmic insoluble aggregates that are visible under the microscope. And these aggregates are typically inherited for 10,000 to a million generations and then disappear until another cell spontaneously acquires prion phenotype. So prion protein before they aggregate tend to be involved in processes that regulate flow of genetic information, transcription, RNA processing, or and translation, for example. So consequently, alterations um, in these processes by pre-information affect the way that the information is expressed, causing changes in phenotype that can have dramatic consequences for the cell. And they can both be beneficial or detrimental. The prion can, can be seen as an added layer of variation that may give the population a greater chance of surviving. So in this picture, um, you can see one of the applications of prions called biological bed hedging, a process that maximizes survival of the population in changing environment. And here is a short list of recently discovered beneficial prions in yeast. In fact, at least one third of wild type isolates harbor traits that can be attributed to prions. And these traits can include changes in resistance to antibiotics or cell adhesion or alterations in the way yeast cells use nutrients. And these observations are rather new and they raise important questions. Why yeast use prions as a source of phenotypic diversity rather than using common genetic variations or transcriptional noise? Also, how widespread is this phenomenon among other species? And what I'm interested most, how old are, is this phenomenon? It is not clear uh, that the same, so, or sorry, it is now clear that the same mechanism that causes neuro, uh, neurological disorders is now responsible for basic cellular processes. And in the future, when we learn how to use it, it could become a new tool in regulation of biochemical processes. So in recent years, we have witnessed shift in perspective on prions from rare infectious agents to common protein with important functions. Um, but could this mechanism be also old? So personally, I was very intrigued by the numerous functions of prions because it seems that this robust mechanism is based on a very simple structure. The properties that uh, prions have are exactly what we are looking for in origin of life hypothesis. Simplicity, durability, self-replication. Yet it is not clear how old this mechanism is. So I decided to check how far back in evolutionary history we can find prions. Is it, for example, possible that Luca had prions? So far, characteristic of prions do not preclude their ancient origin. Contrary, several observations support the idea. For example, the aggregation domain is usually located in disordered fragment of the protein. 
So theoretically, prion-like aggregation could predate complicated protein folds. In the case of some uh, prions, the amino acid sequence can be randomized without losing the ability to form amyloid, which means that the sequence itself doesn't have to be conserved to still retain the prion function. And importantly, prebiotically possible, plausible peptides can self-assemble to produce amyloids. And we know that amyloids are uh, structural elements of prions. And finally, in the lab, almost any protein can be forced to form amyloid if we find the proper conditions. They're usually very harsh. So at the beginning of my project, when I was looking through the literature, I found uh, that prions have already been verified in eukaryotes and over time with in two bacteria, just very recently. And with this little number of, exa of examples, it's impossible to draw conclusions about the phylogenetic relationship of different prions. So our priority should be to find more prions to be able to assess their evolutionary origins. And my idea caught the attention of evolutionary biologist Lynn Rothschild, who became my supervisor at NASA. And this is how we started our hunt for prions. Our first step was to create the list of candidate prions in archaea, uh, because the only domain of life not studied regarding to prions by, um, at, the, at the time. And it is possible to, um, to, pre to predict prions or prion forming domains because they have distinct amino acid composition. And because enough prions have been verified in yeast, they can be used, their amino acid composition can be used to train machine learning algorithms. And the machine learning algorithms can be used to scan the whole Uniprot database and ser search for candidates for prions and the candidates can be further tested in laboratory. So our bioinformatics um, search um, we performed, that we performed on more than 1,000 archaeal proteomes showed that 873 proteomes had at least one prion candidate. Um, on, the, on the tree that you can see, each blue line indicates a proteome with at least one candidate and shows uh, that the distribution of prion on this tree, the on the phylogenetic tree of archaea that it is, is more or less uniform. Next, we performed an analysis of functions uh, based uh, of these candidates, and we found that uh, str a strong enrichment among proteins that relate that are related to regulation and transcription. And this observation is consistent with observations uh, in other organisms and is probably related to the fact that, that prions can act as molecular switches. Then we conducted a series of experiments to confirm the prion properties of 16 selected candidates. And out of 16 tested uh, candidates, eight of them were able to form amyloids. And we showed, that, uh, we showed that six were able to carry information by recreating non-Mendelian patterns of inheritance. So at first, uh, our first experiment, uh, I used method in which the candidate prion protein was expressed um, in E. coli. The E. coli was, uh, and also exported. The E. coli was growing on medium supplement with the congaret, and the congaret is a dye that specifically binds amyloids, causing the amyloid uh, producing colonies to turn red. This was the first level of our experimental screen. Then I used electron microscopy and then examined the morphology of the aggregates formed by prion candidate prion domains. Uh, those that yield positive results in the previous test. And I noticed that eight out of 16 tested indeed formed uh, amyloid fibers. Consecutively, I used several uh, spectroscopic methods 
uh, we, with this metals, we confirmed that the aggregation kinetics is typical for amyloid formation, and we confirmed high content of beta sheet that is also typical for amyloids. Then I used yeast-based uh, assay to test if the protein candidate can function as a protein-based element of inheritance or the information transfer. For this purpose, I repl um, replaced the original prion domain of well-studied yeast prion called SUP35 and the protein, yeast prion protein SUP35 uh, with the prion domain of the candidate prion from archaea that I was investigating. It's a very convenient assay and I can explain it more in details at the end of the seminar if someone asks. But ultimately, the six candidates that we tested were able to create a prion, which was trackable because this assay, in this assay, it allowed the prion allows cells to grow an adenine-free media, and the colonies obtain a characteristic red color. So after conducting the experiments, the laboratory part, we went back to bioinformatics and compared amino acid sequences of those candidates who passed the verification with those who have not passed it. It turned out that the positive candidates had an increased content of tyrosine and phenylalanine compared to the candidates who tested negatively. And this result is in line with previous analysis of known prions. In conclusion, our experiment demonstrated uh, for the first time that in the proteomes of archaea, one can find proteins with uh, prion-like properties. So our observation completed the picture of the distribution within the main branches of the evolutionary tree of life, distribution of prions on it, and suggest that uh, there might be a continuity between the first abiotic amyloid and the modern prions that act as regulators of numerous biochemical processes and unfortunately sometimes contributing to pathology. At the end, I'd like to mention that recently we have submitted a grant proposal to NASA in which we propose um, amyloid and prion research on ISS. Uh, we would measure the effect of microgravity on the frequency of acquisition of heritable prion-like phenotypes, first of known prions. And we will identify novel amyloid candidates in genomes of bacteria recovered from ISS. We would also characterize their role in biofilm formation and also test the influence of anti-amyloid substances on biofilm formation to, as a way to counteract it. And with a little bit of help, we will be flying the payload to ISS as soon as next year. During the pandemics, I also had, um, in, have, I have initiated a Polish Astrobiological Society. And together with Sanjoy, Hari, and Sid, we are starting a new action group at uh, Blue Marble Space that is named Building Astrobiological Communities. So if, if any one of you is interested, let me know and uh, I can let you know about meetings. With this, I would like to thank you all for listening. And I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues, collaborators, and Polish funding agency that made this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. And I see we already have a hand.